So good evening. Uh, I wanted to thank Maribel, but also Eline for this great invitation. It's the first time I'm in Luxembourg. I think I crossed by car once, but uh, first time I'm really here. Okay, so what is an architecture biennale and who is it for? What differentiated these forms of display from all other architecture exhibitions? Should an architecture biennale be informative, reflective, productive, retrospective, historical? Or should it be a laboratory for ideas or an opportunity for experimental proposals? To try to answer these questions, my lecture today will unpack the prehistory and beginnings of the Venice Architecture Biennale and highlight the political aspects and the disciplinary tensions that lie behind such displays before looking at the challenges posed by contemporary examples of architecture biennial and triennial. So as you see, I'm trying to do a lot tonight. Let's hope I'm not too long. Uh, the lecture is based on the research I have done, and Maribel showed uh, two books. So the lecture I have done over the past uh, 15 years on the history and theory of architecture exhibition, and more particularly uh, biennial. But it is also informed by my work as a curator. First, uh, I did a small installation um, in the Monditalia exhibition at the 2014 Venice Biennale, and more recently uh, co-curated the It's About Time, the main exhibition of the 10th International Architecture Biennale of Rotterdam last fall. So it's also very interesting to be on the other side uh, of, the, of the fence. In other words, this lecture will also discuss how an architecture biennale can mobilize different methods of communication between showing the project and producing installations and atmospheres while operating as, a, as spaces for experimentation as well as new economic and cultural agents. Exhibitions have been very important for the discipline of architecture since the 18th century. I'm sure you all know that. They created an audience by engaging professionals and non -prof by engaging professional and non-professional public. And despite the fact that practices of display have been as clearly demonstrated by uh, scholars like Beatrice Colomina or Jean-Louis Cohen, instrumental to the development of modern architecture, after 1968, a year often seen as a moment of shift and a seismic and a moment of seismic social and political changes across the globe. So after 68, the practice of exhibiting of exhibiting architecture shifted and multiplied, creating a new paradigm for the public display of architecture. The Venice Biennale, also known as the mother of all the Biennale, uh, now holds a large-scale international architecture exhibition every other year. It used to be the, the um, it used to be the uh, the even year, and now it's the odd year because of the pandemic. Certainly, the most important stage of, architect of the architecture world, the 18th Venice Architecture Biennale will open on the 20th of May, 2023, under the title, The Laboratory of the Future. But in the next hour, I will try to explain to you what happened between this image and this image. In other words, what happened between 1895 and 2023. The first international art exhibition of the city of Venice opened on the 22nd of April 1895. But in reality, it started, or the, the story I'm about to tell you started well before. In 1797, Napoleon Bonaparte invite, invite, invaded the city of Venice and in 1807, he validated a proposal from Venetian architect Gian Antonio Selva for the demolition of the furthermost part of the Castello Quarter and the planning of a new public garden for Venice, the Giardini. Then, in 1887, following the recent unification of Italy, 
An Esposizione Nazionale was organized in the Venice Giardini. As art historian Vittoria Martini wrote, and I quote, the Italian political unification also imposed the need of national celebrations in the artistic realm, where artists from all regions in Italy could display works. Venice, the last city to be annexed to the kingdom, was beginning to note the success of other national celebrations around the country and wished to take part, and wished to take part Unlike the industrial exhibition in Rome, Milan, and above all, Turin, the Venice National Exhibition was concerned strictly with art. The Giardini was an excellent choice, and the exhibition met with great public success. No other capital possessed such an adequate location with such a unique panorama." End of quote. So the Giardini became, in a way with this exhibition, a new urban and modern space alternative to the ancient and traditional Piazza San Marco. Following the success of the 1887 exhibition, a group of artists and intellectuals, including the then mayor of Venice, met at the Café Florian in Piazza San Marco to discuss the idea of creating a fixed expositional structure that would become a lasting tourist attraction for the city and would reinvigorate it on an economic level aroused in a municipal context. In, it was also a way to, uh, by the way, to attract tourists, something that we would think today Venice doesn't really have to worry about, but... On April 19, 1893, the City Council of Venice passed a resolution that provided for the holding of a biannual international art exhibition, Esposizione Internazionale d'Arte della Città di Venezia, that would mark the silver wedding anniversary of King Umberto and Queen Margherita. The first goal of the exhibition was to bring foreign artists to Venice. And the first international exhibition was supposed to take place in 1894, but as we know, Italians are always late, so the exhibition only opened a year later in 1895. Today, the Biennale is a cultural institution with five different uh, sector or section. I, I find it always hard in English, but in, uh, in Italian it's settore. So I translated by sector. So the art that starts in 1895, music started after in 1930, cinema in 1932, the famous uh, Mostra del Cinema, theater in 1934, and then architecture only, as we will see today, in 1979, and finally dance uh, 20 years later in 1999. Here you have a map of the famous uh, Giardini. So it was the success of the first edition of the Art Biennale with more than 200,000 visitors in 1895 and more than 300,000 in 1899 that triggered the building of foreign pavilion since 1907. So pavilion which were added to the already existing uh, central pavilion, which is the one you see, well, the big one, you know, the that then became the Italian pavilion and now is again a sort of central pavilion. The Giardini now hosts 29 pavilions of foreign countries, some of them designed by famous architects such as Joseph Hoffmann's Austrian pavilion, Gerrit Riedveld's Dutch pavilion and Alvar Aalto's Finnish pavilion. By reproducing the universal exhibition's principle of pavilion nation, the Venice Biennale condensed and connected places and artistic production, as well as diverse ideas about nation and cultural identity in an exhibition context. By stated, the national pavilions were, and still are, completely independent from the administration of the Biennale. They operate as embassies to which the principle of extraterritoriality apply, applies. The architecture and the work exhibited in each of the national pavilion are thus bound to the, projection, the protection of the national identities. In other words, when you're in a pavilion, you are in a country. And there was, a, there was an example a few years ago, the... the um, 
the Spanish pavilion w made a sort of uh, installation where you had to show your Spanish passport in order to enter the pavilion. What is now called the Architecture Biennale is in fact a very large exhibition of architecture, an event that since the 2000s has taken place every two years and includes in main, uh, one main exhibition by the director of the Biennale, partly in the Arsenale and partly in the central pavilion located in the Giardini, plus these 29 national pavilion in the Giardini and many others that are located either in the Arsenale after the main exhibition or in places scattered around the city of Venice. And the Luxembourg pavilion is somewhere in the Arsenale. I just remember today talking with someone. Okay, so now a little bit of the prehistory of the Venice Architecture Biennale. Start in 1968. But before talking about the arrival of architecture at the Venice Biennale, I need to mention another cultural institution, a cousin, the Triennale di Milano, an institution that existed since the 1923, um, and it was first called the Biennale, Decorative, uh, Biennale of Decorative Arts of the the city of Monza, and then was moved to Milan and started to have this frequency every three years, so this triennale. From the 1940s to the 1960s, the triennale was the reference in terms of great exhibitions of design, architecture, and urban planning. But the 1964 edition of the triennale, the 13th, for which architect Vittorio Gregotti and writer Umberto Eco chosen the unconventional theme of leisure and free time, tempo libero in, it, in Italian. Uh, and it, so they wanted to talk about um, free time and its links with the world of architecture, the arts, technology, and production. So this exhibition had sparked a series of critique, the public deploring the overly abstract and uncommunicative aspect of the exhibition. Following the, that event, there were a series of debates, one in particular held in 1965 on the attitudes that the Triennale should adopt in response to the paradoxical question of how to exhibit architecture. And we know, I'm not going to extend on that, but we know that this is a very complicated question. Whoops. Uh, the debate was opposing the members of an old guard to those of a new and younger generation. In particular, two, polari uh, two voices polarized the Italian architectural scene at the time. Aldo Rossi, then 34 on the left, and Giancarlo De Carlo, then 46 at the time, here on the right. The debate was between, on the one hand, the idea of, um, on the one hand, a realistic attitude on the awareness of architecture as an autonomous language made of form, forms extracted from reality. So Rossi, that was um, of this, uh, this uh, idea of realistic attitude, wanted to use the instrument specific to architecture, so the drawing, the models, uh, etc., in order to communicate the project. Rossi, in other words, was an advocate of disciplinary autonomy. But on the other hand, you had uh, Giancarlo De Carlo, who defended a more theoretical position, close to the ideas of, the, of Team 10, and which perceived architecture as a conceptual grid, called to put order in human activities by establishing systems of relationships and needs by means of facilities. So De Carlo, in other words, was advocating for a more multidisciplin multidisciplinary spatial approach. So these two visions were kind of uh, in conflict. And then eventually, uh, De Carlo won the battle. The 14th uh, Milan Triennale opened or was due to open on 30th of May 1968. Um, the title was Il Grande Numero, The Large Number, and it referred to the anxiety linked to the loss of individuality with the birth of glo uh, created by the birth of globalization. Problems of the modern society in its relation to modes of production, rapid urbanization, collective mobility and communication, as well to the organization of the territory. 
The exhibition wanted to respond to an increasingly deep social and cultural crisis by representing not only the optimism of the economic boom and the post-war consumer society, but also the concerns of the individual lost in a nascent globalization. But on the day of the opening, the Triennale was taken over by demonstrators. Giancarlo De Carlo tried to address these demonstrators, and after a brief exchange with them, De Carlo asked the president of the Triennale to open the door to the crowds. Once students and artists entered the palace, the Palazzo dell'Arte, they formed an assembly and began to occupy the exhibition, forcing it to close. It was not a direct criticism of the exhibition itself, but rather a protest against the bourgeois society that was behind it. De Carlo said, and I quote, it can, it can be said with bitterness that the need to organize an exhibition on large numbers has been, has been relentlessly demonstrated by those who destroyed it, end of quote. Therefore, from 1968, the exhibition can be seen not only as a series of events, but also as a project in its own right, and demonstrating being, uh, yeah, the demonstration being um, part of this, of this project, in a way. A few weeks later, the Venice Art Biennial, like many other institutions in 68, faced a crisis that resulted also in activism. The protest included calls for renewing exhibition practices and the system of values which they were founded on. So the Biennale was also occupied, occupied by a demonstrator, an occupation of the exhibition, but also it sparked a series of protests which used the urban space as a stage for political agency. And here you see an image um, uh, done by Hugo Mulas in um, Piazza San Marco. So this is what happened in 68. Then a few years later, in 1973, after five years of instability, the Triennale reopens again. And this time it's Rossi who has the chance to do his exhibition. So the exhibition is titled Architettura Città. And here you see all the participants of this exhibition. It also includes a lot of exchange with um, uh, the scene of the United States. And it was an exhibition that really explored the relationship between project and the city. Trying to, uh, it was exhibiting intervention project for cities such as Berlin, Rome, Barcelona, Venezia, uh, Zurich, Naples, etc. But most importantly, the exhibition proposed a return to a rational methodology characterized by a deep understanding of architecture's internal building logic. It led to a new understanding of architecture as a discipline that existed both within and against political power. So as you see, it was really um, maps and drawings and um, large models that were um, exhibited, really rep representing the project, the architectural project. In 1968, the Venice Biennale was, like the Milan Triennale a few weeks earlier, attacked by demonstrators, aiming to reevaluate the Italian art institution that was seen as too elitist and remote from people's daily concerns. This forced, uh, this forced a complete reform of the institution, which would eventually lead to the adoption of a new law in 1973. And here on this image, you see the new uh, president of the Biennale at the time, Carlo Ripadimeana. I will come back on him uh, later. So this new law, the law 438, was uh, adopted in July 1973 and transformed completely the Biennale, which had been accused during the protest of 68 of being festivalesque, uh, of being a festivalesque organization and a place for dealers. The, mis the mission statement of the new uh, statute became the Venice Biennale is a, is a democratically organized institute which aims to ensure total freedom of ideas and expressive forms in order to promote permanent activities and organize international events for the documentation, 
knowledge, critique, research, and experimentation in the, fields of, in the field of arts. During the quadriennal period of 64 to 77, so here we are really in the prehistory of the Architecture Biennale, the Venice Biennale, under the presidency of the socialist Carlo Ripadimeana, temporarily forewent on celebratory exhibition in favor of a thematic approach. So this is also important, huh? the thematic approach that we uh, know now, which included crossovers of the various disciplines, art, cinema, theater, etc. cetera. Um, and, and was so called Biennale per una cultura democratica e antifascista, so Biennale for a antifascist and democratic culture, these exhibitions were dedicated to the struggle for democracy and acted as a battlefield, giving voice to a different, to a different meaning of the nation involved. Political incorrectness and provocations were used to promote an unofficial culture paired with an unauthorized representation. So it was a four years where there was really a lot of action at the Biennale, and I would say the, there was a, a period that was extremely interesting. So one of the things that happened is that the different um, director were named. So here you see three of them, uh, um, Giacomo Gambetti for cinema, Luca Ronconi, who passed away very recently in the middle for theater, and then finally the bold guy is Vittorio Gregotti, who was, as you know, an architect, um, but he was surprisingly named as the director of the art biennial. So that's really where things start. So why Vittorio Gregotti? Um, so Vittorio Gregotti was an architect, but he was very close to the art world, and also because of personal relationship, as it happens very often in life, he was chosen, and he, he was asked to be the director of the art biennale, and he replied, um, that he would accept only under two conditions. The first one, that the Biennale be organized around a central theme, the theme of the environment, uh, and I will come back uh, to this later, and second, that architecture be integrated into the art biennial, so that it becomes an art and architecture biennial. So, okay, his name in 74, then 75 arrived, and Gregotti started by a series of initi initiative and experiments, so those were not really a biennial, they were like small initiative where, that were undertook in Venice and beyond, bringing the activities of the Biennale uh, on, on the territory and as far as the terra ferma, as the, what do you say in English, like outside Venice, and really to try to, he was really trying to sort of involve the, the Venetian and the local population. So one of the first gestures that he did, or one of the first gestures that the Biennale did for architecture, was an exhibition called um, A Proposito del Mulino Stucchi, about the Mulino Stucchi. And that was in 1975. So the Biennale organized an international competition by invitation to prefigure the possibility of a creative reuse of this neo-Gothic uh, Mulino Stucchi that you see uh, here. It was a, a by then disused floor mill built between 1884 and 1895 on the western end of the Judeca Island. So if you have been to Venice, it's now a Hilton Hotel, but it's a very um, impressive building. So more than the production of real architecture project, this competition wanted to trigger a process that can, be, that can draw general consideration on the relationship between collective creativity and the image of the city. Therefore, it was not reserved to a particular category of cultural operators or, by, or to architects, but was also open to a lot of visual artists. So this is really a time where the, at the Biennale there was a lot of interaction between art and architecture. The products of the competition were later presented in an exhibition and associated publication and were judged by not only a jury of experts, but very importantly by inhabitants of Venice. Um, so if some critique, uh, critiques claim that the exhibition uh, presented to the population as a concrete recovery operation for the old factory, 
turned into a sterile and evasive intellectualist operation. So some people, it was, these projects were, a lot of them were not really concrete or realistic. They were a bit artistic and for some too uh, intellectual. Uh, nevertheless, it helped uh, saving the building, who is now still standing. So it, the Biennale in this case had a real impact on the architecture of Venice. And what perhaps distinguishes this example, uh, no, sorry, uh, the exhibition was highly speculative and artistic, as I said, um, but it also raised awareness in uh, documenting this, uh, this uh, building and, and saving it. And just quickly, I'm gonna pass quickly on this, but it was presented then, the exhibition, they wanted to present it in the Mulino Stuki, which would also add sort of layer to exhibiting architecture. But for some reason, it was, the access was refused, so it was presented in the Magazzini del Sale uh, on the other side of the Giudecca, but that also was a building that was uh, supposed to be demolished. So here again, the Biennale helped saving uh, another part of Venice. Now, uh, 1976. Now to, I'm gonna just quickly take you out of Venice and bring you to Paris, just to remind a little bit also the context of those years, right? So it's a, it's a period in which um, a lot of cultural institutions after 68 are uh, kind of rethinking themselves or being invented. So obviously the paradigmatic example is the Centre Pompidou who was opened in January 77. So when we talk about Biennale in, in 76, it's just the same period when the, it's probably, this picture is probably a bit earlier than 76, but when the building was uh, being uh, built in Paris. So a lot of cultural institutions were undergoing major changes. And in 1976, Gregotti organized, so this is when he organized really his first big uh, Biennale, so the 37th International Exhibition of Art and Architecture, and actually it's the, it's the 37th Exhibition of Art, but it's the first and only exhibition of art and architecture, under the theme Ambiente Arte, or in English it would translate that as um, Environment Art. But we have to think that environment is not uh, in the sense of um, uh, sustainability. It's really in the sense of the environment that is around us. So I found this uh, nice uh, review from the New York Times uh, at, the, at the time. So I'm just going to read a very short uh, extract. So Venice. Postponed for a month due to the Italian elections, the Venice Biennale opened last Sunday, the first Biennale since political demonstrations in St. Mark's Squares against the Biennale of the Bosses closed the show in 1972. Since then, the pavilions have become dilapidated and overgrown, their windows smashed, their walls peeling. Many thought the big show would never take place again. Some found it an anachronism anyway, with its national pavilions dotted around Venice's leafy public gardens like so many miniature embassies. The United States' tiny Monticello, Britain's neo-Palladian col colonial, Germany's stripped Third Reich classical, the Soviet Union's pre-1917 Russian Orthodox. So Ambiente Arte was really interesting because it's not only an exhibition of art and architecture, but it's really a case where the Biennale was in a way framed by architecture. Ambiente Arte was an active exhibition where the concept of space took a pre precise meaning. Space and spectators were the absolute protagonist of the show. So here you see, for example, the, the exhibition by uh, Greek artist Yanis Kounilis, where he put um, basically uh, horses in the, in the Biennale. Um, so it was really about how, the, how in the art, the relation between the work of art and the surrounding space was growing and how it was changing. And in this exhibition, uh, there was also, interestingly, three architecture exhibitions, two historicals, one that are not so interesting for our 
um, story here, but one on the uh, Italy during the fascism that you see here, and one on the origin of the Werkbund. In any case, two historical exhibitions that were questioning the origins of the modern movement. But the third one was the one that really interested me, because it's really the prehistory of the Biennale as we know it today, where key figures from contemporary international scene of architecture are presented. The exhibition was called Europa America, Centro Storico Suburbio, so Europe, America, um, Historic Center and Suburbia, 25 Contemporary Architect. It was uh, organized by Gregotti on the European side and Peter Eisenman and the EA, the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies in New York on organizing the American contingent. So it was really also a meeting of American and European. It was uh, also linked to the city because again, it was in the Magazzini del Sale so also linking with the recovery of buildings in Venice. So what happened in this exhibition is that the Europeans presented more like ongoing projects. Here you see Lucien Crowe's um, installation, and they really saw this exhibition, the European, as an opportunity to present projects that were uh, in progress um, and what they were doing in a sense. And then the Americans, on the other hand, presented much more experimental uh, and theoretical speculations. So for example, here you see uh, the exhibition by Raymond Abraham that was called Seven Gates to Eden, where he presented this kind of poetic and formal exercise, really a metaphor, a declination of the archaic house using the tool of the architect, so the model, the drawing, but really trying to present a more um, hypothetical and poetic project. And then, but for some architects, it's, it was also a platform to reflect on the theme of the city and create works which in some cases will be truly significant. So for example, you see an image of Aldo Rossi, uh, with his finger in the glue, preparing his exhibition, and uh, with the, um, the exhibition for which he, with his assistant, produced uh, this collage called the Cita Analoga, uh, which is a very, imp I mean, you might have heard about it, a very important piece uh, for uh, architecture of those years that was also acquired a few years ago by the Centre Pompidou. So at the Biennale, there was also a debate, which I wrote about, but I'm not going to extend too much about, but a place where all these architects came together to discuss and really redefine, um, so, uh, redefine the institution uh, um, and redefine their relationship to uh, what was seen at the time as a sort of failure of the modern movement as a project. So they really used the Biennale as a platform for debate, confrontation, and also for the advancement of the discipline and for meeting. So in the 1970s, under the direction of Carlo di Padimeana, the Biennale broke off into a radically politicized agenda, explicitly addressing the nationhoods and politics of three countries. So there was in 77 another Biennale called Biennale del Dissenso, where they uh, talked about um, former USSR, and then in 76 there was an exhibition about Spain. So the Biennale at the time really acted as a sort of agent provocateur for democracy. The exhibition there were in those years transformed into a political device and a crucial apparatus for public confrontation. And also, as I showed here, confrontation between different factions of uh, architects. It was in those years that the Venetian institution echoed the hottest topic of the time. It did this by becoming an experimental workshop in which ideas protest and a culture of dissent joined together in an effort to challenge traditional modes of display. In particular, the theme of democracy was channeled at the Biennale, transforming the exhibition into a political device and a crucial apparatus uh, for confrontation. So now we arrive to the real uh, start of the architecture Biennale in 79, 
when uh, Paolo Portoghese, a Roman architect and historian, was named or appointed as the first director of the architecture sector of the Biennale. And here you see him very young, he's now 90, 92, 93 years old. Um, so in his capacity of director um, of the Biennale, Portoghese did a, a first gesture in 1979 where he uh, joined with the theater um, sector of the Biennale and created this exhibition called Venezia and the, uh, Venice and the Scenic Space for which he commissioned Aldo Rossi to build this very famous um, so the Biennale also as a, as a platform for the creation of one of the most famous uh, work of, of um, postmodern architecture, the Teatro del Mondo. So they uh, built this theater in 1979 uh, as a sort of highly performative piece of architecture, a wood and steel theater that acted as an experiment and a signal of the Biennale that was to come a year later marking the beginning of an era moving toward architecture as event. So in this case, uh, it was exhibiting the project, so the, what you know, Rossi wanted, um, but not with a simulacra, not with a model or a drawing, not with something that represented the project, but with the project itself. It was the project itself which was exhibited. And it was the city which was put on display through this allegory of the theater uh, moving. And then after this little, it was almost like a, a little announcement of the Architecture Biennale to come in 1980. And here I will do a super summary because, you know, I wrote a whole book about it, so I will try to explain in five minutes. This exhibition, um, where for which Port Portuguese, which you see here again, young, wanted to, and that's really important, wanted to not just represent architecture through pictures, uh, models, etc., but wanted to, and this is his word, really put the public in contact, in direct contact with architecture. Um, and I like this image because you see behind him one of the facade of the of the real scale facade of the exhibition, but you also see the little models that they built uh, from the drawings that were sent by the architect before building the real thing. So you see also what is normally exhibited in an architecture exhibition. Then what happened in this case is that there was really also a, um, an adequacy with the, with the exhibition container, with the space, which is the Arsenale, this is an image of the Corderia dell'Arsenale, which is now used for the, the art and the architecture biennale every year. But it was the first time in 1980 that this space was used. And by visiting this abandoned uh, proto-industrial ro rope factory, uh, it was in visiting this space that Portuguese really had the idea of his exhibition, um, uh, of, of doing a street so he built a street inside the exhibition space, and, but the idea really came from the space itself, from this perspective of the Arsenale. So what he did uh, is to build what he called the Strada Novissima, inspired by, the idea was inspired, the idea of reconstructing a street inside the Corderia dell'Arsenale uh, was based on the model of the Strada Nuova, or the Via Garibaldi, which is the main street in Renaissance uh, Italian city, a residential street where uh, each important family has a palace to represent itself. So he decided to do a street where 20 architects would have a facade or a, a palace to sort of represent their architecture. So this is an initial drawing that I found in the archive. So the idea was to build giant model and to create an immersive space that would put the public, as he said, really in contact with architecture. So the heart of the exhibition was this 70 meters long street um, and he selected 20 most fa fashionable or the most important architect or the one that represented um, well, it's a complicated story of compromise with other organizers but they eventually chose uh, the 20 uh, representant of this uh, postmodern architecture. 
Uh, here you see the names of the exhibitors. I'm not go going to read them and the documents that were uh, given to them, the rules that they had to follow. So the first international architecture exhibition of the Venice Biennale finally opened on 27 of July 1980. It was called The Presence of the Past. Um, and uh, yeah, and this, this, this part, the street, was the Strada Novissima. Uh, the, the exhibition is or will be remembered forever as a unique curatorial gesture. Uh, in a way, I would like to propose it's a synthesis between Rossi's vision and that of the Carlo, between the project and the installation. In this exhibition, also what is very important, as I said, is the strong link with the uh, exhibition space, the magnificent exhibition space of the Arsenal. And here you see again all the facades that were uh, presented, um, workers working on the uh, exhibition space by Robert Venturi, um, the probably most famous facade, the colonnade by Hans Hollein. And also the space with the visitors to give an idea also of this, uh, this uh, street uh, as a kind of um, representational and political space as well. Okay, so this was the first, and then there was a series of other architecture biennale, which I will mention uh, uh, quickly. So in the 80s, uh, 1985 was the uh, third international architecture of uh, the Venice Biennale. It was curated by Aldo Rossi. Uh, Paolo Portoghesi had then become the president, so he named his friend Aldo Rossi. Um, and from the beginning of the 1980s until 1996, when it was the first time that the curator was a, a foreigner, Hans Olein, so from, from the 80s until the mid-90s, it was always uh, very Italian. It was always Italian uh, curators uh, and very faithful to Rossi's idea, that of exposing architecture projects. So this third international exhibition was called Project Venice and included international competition for which Rossi invited well-known architects but also younger ones to present ideas and innovative projects for uh, upgrading and transforming specific areas of Venice and the Interland. But what is important also uh, here, I think, is you see, as you see on this picture, is the production. So the Biennale acted as a, as a machine in a way that made architects produce a lot of drawings, a lot of, and we have to remember that this is also the time when architect artifact, drawings and model, start to have an economic value, start to enter the art market, and so it's also the, BNA, the exhibition becomes a way of producing uh, works. 1991, the fifth international architecture exhibition was curated by architectural historian Francesco Dalco, and for the first time, the Architecture Biennale is really modeled on the Art uh, Biennale with national participation in the Giardini. So before that, there was no, uh, before 91, there was no uh, national pavilions for architecture. Um, so this exhibition uh, was also the occasion of creating this beautiful uh, piece. If you have been to Venice, you might have seen these Ali by Massimo Scolari. And I would like to quote here uh, Christoph van Geroway, who uh, wrote a, a piece on that particular uh, Biennale for Oase. So uh, van Geroway writes, for the first time, the national pavilions in the Giardini were filled with national exhibitions, which Dalco did not curate, but for which he did appoint curators. Virtually, without exceptions, the curator seized the opportunity to present successful contemporary architecture produced within their individual national borders. So that's really the start of this idea of representing the nation through architecture. Um, it was also the occasion of building this pavilion, which is the very last, uh, no, sorry, it's not the last pavilion, I think, that was built, but one of the last, which is the bookshop by, um, by Sterling in the, in the Giardini. 
1996, as I said, the first time a foreigner is uh, in charge with the curation of the Biennale, the sixth international architecture exhibition, Sensing the Future, the architect as seismograph was curated by architect Hans Olein. It's also the beginning of this trend of asking architects to curate the Biennale, practicing art or key figures, and you will notice that most of them had a Pritzker before or will have a Pritzker after, so there's quite a, a link between those two. Um, and Holein did not choose project, but architects who were going to present one or two projects, preferably realized or in the process of being realized. There's, uh, I didn't find a lot of image of this, exp I didn't see that Biennale, so this is one of the image um, in the central pavilion, I think. And then we arrive to the 2000s. So then we have a regular, that's when the regular uh, rhythm starts, huh? 2002, 4, 6, 8, etc. Uh, the Arsenale, and the, here I chose specifically all these uh, kind of almost the same perspective of the Arsenale each time, the same uh, view. The Arsenal is a very particular exhibition space, and we can see this space as a palimpsest where the different exhibitions of the Biennale are printed year after year from the 2000s. The Biennale becomes a private institution at that time and takes its cruising rhythm. The exhibition becomes really a biannual, and we have a real alternation between art and architecture. So one year it's art, one year it's architecture. It's also at that time that Paolo Baratta becomes president of the Biennale, and Baratta will be the longest uh, ever president. So he was president, um, he's not anymore, but it's quite recent. So since, uh, since the two, early 2000, and with a short interruption in, between 2004 and six, and then until uh, very recently. So what characterizes these years is the theme, this idea of having a theme, or I would say rather a slogan, uh, that is not always very significant, uh, if you think about the title of the last Biennale, uh, in terms of message, but they still, um, therefore they report on the modern architectural culture and celebrate the star system, as I say the link also with the Pritzker, and until 2008, we stick very much with the idea of Rossi to show project. We use to, the tools of the architect and then of the urban planner in 2006 uh, to show uh, um, what is going on in the discipline. So now I will just pass very quickly, but in 2002, next, curated by Dayan Sojik, an English critic, um, then in 2004, Metamorph, curated by um, Kurt Foster. Then a bit of an oddity, 2006, Cities, Architecture and Society, curated by Ricky Burdett, who was really a sort of exhibition about urbanism. Um, and 2008, Out There, Architecture Without Building, Aaron Betsky. Um, and then an interesting one, 2010, by Kazuyo Sejima. Also, uh, I have to say it, almost uh, one of the only women who ever curated the Biennale. We have one this year. Uh, so the Japanese architect Kazuyo uh, Sejima, uh, her exhibition was called People Meet in Architecture. So also a title that I don't find particularly inspiring. inspiring but... Uh, what was very interesting, I think, in this exhibition was, again, the relationship between art and architecture was quite present. And instead of having a lot, a lot of exhibitors, she had um, much larger pieces like this uh, piece here, um, which really took on uh, to play with the, with the space of the Arsenale again. And then uh, the lion went to... Uh, Ishigami, which uh, basically uh, talked about the dematerialization of architecture. And then, obviously, 2014 with Rem Koolhaas, elements of architecture uh, that really for many people represented a turning point, uh, a break, uh, where it was not so much big figure of architecture who were presented, some people um, kind of ironically said that the only star was, was Rem himself, but anyway, there was uh, another idea of really uh, 
um, yeah, not having big names, but having more a Biennale that was focused on research and using the Biennale as a platform for research. Um, and then 2016, I, I, you see, I, will, I, I was actually preparing the, the conference. I was trying to remember some of these titles because I think sometimes they are so insignificant. That So 2016, reporting from the front, 2018, free space, 2021, how will we live together? And now uh, uh, the coming one. So... Now, and now I'm gonna, uh, I don't know if I still have time because here I see 7.30, but can I continue for another 10 minutes? Yeah, okay, you're not. Huh? Ask the audience, yeah, can I continue for another 10 minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, so now I will shift to a little bit of a, of a different um, uh, history, if you want. It, that, now it's the now, but I'm not going to talk only about the Venice Biennale, but trying to see also, and this is the topic of the latest book that I did with uh, Columbia Press, but it's more the culture of Biennale and Triennale, and what is this, this world of, of these large-scale exhibitions that appear everywhere. So since the first Biennale of Architecture in Venice in the late 70s and early 1980s, architecture biennials and triennials have multiplied with a real acceleration in the last few years. Oslo, Rotterdam, Shenzhen, Lisbon, Moscow, Istanbul, Seoul, Tallinn, Sao Paulo, and more recently, Chicago and Sharjah, just to name a few. I'm sure this list is not up to date now, but... Um, today, architecture biennials and triennials are new disciplinary agents in architecture. They are happening at re regular intervals. These large-scale exhibitions use architecture, design, and urban environment more broadly to tackle societal topics, ranging from sustainability to our sense of belonging and from robotization to the power of form. They follow and record economic crisis, city crisis, migration crisis, and they speak of a phenomena, of phenomena closely linked to the world situation rather than just architecture per se. In brief, the word biennale, uh, Italian for every other year, is and amongst the most over prized term of early 21st century is commonly used to describe a large-scale international contemporary exhibition and happening. The word has also become, however, a label, almost a brand, used and abused by cities around the globe in an attempt to increase their value and cultural capital. You notice that I wrote this very critical word before curating one myself. So now I, <laughs> I feel a bit ashamed. So, and if the concept was originally associated with its potential for diplomatic and international relations as well as urban regeneration, it is now too often seen as nothing more than an overblown symptom of spectacular event culture the result of some of the spacious transformation of the world in the age of late capitalism. Biennales and triennales are linked to the idea of emerging trends, or originally they were linked to this idea. They were invented like big barometers, showing the world the best production of the last two years, and therefore supposed to reveal current trends. But in an age of hyper-communication and growing individualism, in individualism in terms of architecture, I mean, biennials and triennials can no longer play such a role. What then is the real ro role of these major exhibitions? A unique platform of its kind, architecture biennial and triennial are not limited to the exhibition itself. These are, of course, exhibitions, but they are also other adjacent platform whose format could be more effective in responding quickly and flex flexibly to contemporary development in the arts and architecture. So in other words, they are exhibition, but they are books, they are online um, um, presence, etc. In fact, if temporarily, if temporality is the ultimate definition of the term biennale, the obsolete nature of the two-year cycle may well partly explain the imminent irrelevance of the Biennale. 
In the era of immediate and almost universal access to information, Biennale and Triennale are no longer a place to show things in progress, but rather a place to generate new content. The Biennale and Triennale are not limited to the gallery space or even the city space. They develop in other parallel spaces, that of the catalog, the design identity, the communication in general. They are also developing in the internet space, thanks to millions of images posted on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and other, other social media platforms. That's where I stop. Uh, I don't know about TikTok and all these others. And the very common practice of exhibition selfies uh, shows how often the Biennale and Triennale operate mainly according to the photogeny of the work or the exhibition. And this should have been with this image, but here you have an exhibition selfie. But uh, yeah, I think when I also curated exhibition for the Biennale, this is the kind of thing you unavoidably think about. And that is why in the small, the Columbia books, we decided to have only images, uh, I say we, with the editor, only images that were taken from Instagram. So we had a, like a research assistant that was searching with, with hashtag for images so we only show the images as they were circulated on social media, images of biennial. Biennials and triennial expand also in the urban territory. They reshape the network of cultural spaces and institution. They often contribute directly to the reappropriation of obsolete spaces. Capitalizing on a phenomenon related to the Bilbao effect, they aim to advance urban marketing by establishing architectural circuits in cities in an attempt to do something also for local businesses. And here you have sort of maps of the different uh, biennials uh, around the world. In Venice, the Biennale is now the occasion to put the magnificent space of the Arsenale on display every year not just for the eyes of the Venetian public, but also to the international visitors. And uh, the contact between the exhibition of the Biennale and the architecture of the Laguna goes far beyond the Arsenale, because as you know, it grows bigger and bigger every year and uses a plethora of disused spaces like palazzi and churches in Venice, so it really sort of interwaves the exhibition with the uh, city fabric. But there are other examples, for example, in Lisbon, the uh, architecture Triennale has its headquarter in a, um, a former high school that was given to them by the city. Uh, the building was falling apart and the Triennale had the uh, task, if they would take the space, to ultimately renovate the building. So instead of aiming at just a, an exhibition that would happen every three years, they also have a sort of permanent um, uh, trace in the city and a permanent impact. Uh, then this is an image of Manifesta, which I took in my book. I know it's not really a Biennale, but I thought in this case the Manifesta 12 in Palermo was really, it was also curated by architect and really had a sort of mix of art and architecture and the city. So sometimes Biennale and Triennale, through performative intervention, mixed art and architecture and become the real catalyst for a city's renewal, creating in a way a new image for the city. The case of Manifesta 12 in Palermo, which was the occasion of a very serious research um, on and into the city has been cited over and over in the past years. In Manifesta 12, the project was the city itself, a particularly successful imbrication between the city and the exhibition, not just because it included a number of intervention in the city, but also because the city was really the script of the whole exhibition. And more specifically, what the city represented in the context of globalization. Performativity was the modus operandi and it was difficult to register where the exhibition stopped and where the city started or the other way around. In Chicago, the Chicago Biennale created in 2015, so one of the latest, is also an example in which the politicians were very strongly engaged in the cultural policies. The event gave new life to the Chicago Cultural Center, a historic building created in 1897 and located right in, uh, the, in downtown, uh, in the middle of downtown. 
from the start, and this is a, a quote by so Sarah Herda, who was the first artistic director and really the initiator of this Biennale, said um, in an interview, from the start we had the idea that the city was the site, that the cultural center was the hub or the main node of a network, but that we really wanted to be integrated into the city. And when they are strongly anchored in city, biennials and triennials activate notions of civic responsibility, while the architect um, uh, become a social and political, or architecture become a social and political instrument. Uh, a very interesting example of this is um, here the uh, stateless embassy uh, by artist Jonas Stahl. So in 2016, in the frame of the Oslo Architecture Triennale, after belonging, artist Jonas Stahl conceived and designed the new the New World Embassy, a stateless embassy developed by, Kurdish com by the Kurdish community and the autonomous region of Rojava, northern Syria. So this was built inside the Radouset, the, the city, the Hotel de Ville, the city hall, thank you, of Oslo. The embassy proposed a space in which to discuss the ideal of stateless democracy. It brought together different groups who were trying not to limit their democratic systems and communities to the boundaries of the nation state. Questions of identity, autonomy, diplomacy, and political representation were tackled by the embassy project and all connected to the struggle and ideas developed by the autonomous region of Rojava. By reframing not only the beautiful and highly symbolic space of Oslo Radhuset, but also reframing the space of the Kurdish community with the Norwegian, within the Norwegian society, uh, Jonas Stahl proposed here a very poetic superimposition of space and discourse, power and discipline, and that was, um, let's say, prompt or completely due to a, an architecture a triennial. So with the proliferation, I'm almost finished. With the proliferation of biennials and triennials, art and design exhibition, we have also witnessed the emergence of a new form of actor in architecture, the architecture and design curator. Using strong themes, these curators not only exhibit existing architectural or urban projects, but often commission architects, researchers, or even artists to think about specific themes and produce new work beyond the communication of architectural projects. It's really uh, the ident identification of a problem that they put on the table and these uh, very um, often now we have these open call for curators which try to um, uh, you know, uh, fish for the better, best ideas. In recent years, many calls for curator have put forward the idea of the exhibition as a project and as a research, a platform for the advancement and innovation of ideas and epistemological tools which allow the limits of architecture to be extended far into the social, the anthropological, and the political. Undoubtedly, on the rise, although rarely relatively new players in the international landscape of cultural events, the Biennale and Triennale of Architecture and Design always define, uh, sorry, the Biennale, uh, the Biennale and Triennale of Architecture and Design always define their limits while testing the points of friction and possible productive encounter with local communities. So this is something I also forgot to mention with Venice, but the, especially in a place like Venice, the tension between the local and the global is really important because it's such a local and small place, yet it's also an international scene when the Biennale arrives. So, so the encounter with local communities and assessing their potential impact on society. Disciplinary discourse on architecture as well as a, on concrete urban planning. So if we go back to the initial questions, and this is obviously my last slide, without offering a definitive, uh, or without offering any definitive answers to those questions, we can say that an architecture biennale is more than just an exhibition. It is a project, an event, and a platform. It transforms our way to conceive and consume architecture. They are space as much as they are content. 
Moreover, it is undeniable that architecture exhibitions have moved always closer to the idea of architecture as image, collectible, image that have a value, that create a market, and so on. But the old debate opposing the young Aldo Rossi to the old, or relatively old, Giancarlo De Carlo doesn't really stand anymore in our landscape of architecture exhibitions. As I would like to argue, architecture in the postmodern era transformed into something that is no longer merely presented or represented or even experienced in the space of the gallery, but it turned into something that is created and exists in itself through the act of exhibiting. Thank you.